Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Fritz Sörgel. I will be your moderator for this webinar. Welcome to the fifth of this year's series of educational webinars on material characterization entitled Understanding the Flow Behavior of Food. Before we commence with a webinar which will last for about one hour, I would like to draw your attention to the Q&A text entry box at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to type in questions you may have at any time during the presentation so that these can be answered at the end during our general Q&A session. The webinar is being recorded and will be, you will be sent a link to the recorded presentation once this has been prepared for publication. The presentation itself will be made available as a PDF file for you to viewing it in the near future. So without further delay, I would now like to hand over to the presenter, Klaus Oldorp. He is Senior Application Specialist in the Material Characterization Business at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Yes, also hello from my side. This is Klaus speaking. Fritz, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, what I would like to go through with you uh, today is um, an overview about why I think that rheology is a very helpful tool for the food industry in general. So understanding the flow behavior of food. Uh, why is that necessary? If we look at this slide, here I split up what we usually have as food into two different segments. One is the natural food and one is the formulated food, sometimes also called processed food. With the natural food, there we know everything comes from nature, so we are willing to accept, we as a consumer are willing to accept that there are certain differences. So whether I buy an apple here or there, whether it has been freshly harvested or a little bit, or it's already a little bit older, I already know automatically it will taste a little bit different, it will feel a little bit different. So that's what we know. Nature means difference variations. On the other hand, uh, the average consumer expects from formulated food, so something you buy from whatever kind of shop which comes in a bag in a can which is made on an industrial scale that no matter when you buy that no matter where you buy that it should always have the same quality when you open the can the bottle uh, the, the package whatever this is now the tricky bit initially i said we accept that natural food has shows differences and since the formulated food is made on natural ingredients so like the fruit the vegetable the meat that i have listed above so the manufacturer of formulated food has to use raw materials of different origin with different properties but in the end after he has processed that after he has formulated his product he still has to meet the customer's expectations so that it has always the same taste, the same look and the same texture. So that from the customer's point of view, the quality of that food is always the same. In addition to that, of course, since such a food is not being made like in a TV commercial uh, by an old lady with a big pot uh, on, a, uh, on a liter scale, but it's made on an industrial uh, scale production line, we also have to deal the fact with, uh, with the fact that we have certain technical requirements. So the pumping behavior, the mixing behavior, the dosing, the filling behavior, all that also has to be adjusted to meet this process equipment's specifications. Otherwise, we will have problems getting our production speed, our throughput, our quality into the can. So we have these two different um, aspects to keep in mind. So we have to look for the right sensory properties. So how is it how is it seen, how is it felt afterwards when it's, the food is consumed. But we also have to keep in mind that during the production process, we have standardized um, production equipment. 
And no matter at what time of the year we will buy the apples, we will buy the strawberries, we all have to go through the same equipment with the same process. So these are things we have to adjust probably. To do that, we use our viscometers and rheometers and we are able to measure certain parameters. You can see here my little list on the right side. It starts with viscosity, so the probably best known rheological parameter, and then goes viscoelasticity, yield stress, the moduli, but also something like temperature and time dependency, and in the end, a little bit more exotic, the elongational viscosity. From the sensory properties and the process parameters, we need to have a link to what we can do with the rheometer, because the rheometer is not a simulation of our production process or of our consuming um, habits. It's an analytical instrument. But we have already some experience with that, and so we know that between our, let's say, real-life parameters on the left side and our analytical parameters on the right side, there are some very close links. So from this graph, you can see that the mouthfeeling probably is the most complex one because there are five arrows going to different rheological properties on the right side. So here really lots of rheological properties are linked to the mouthfeeling. In the end, the production of food to make a successful product which is accepted by the consumer on the market and to have a good idea about what rheology can do for you is something which is really closely linked. So let's start with the viscosity. As I said, the most well-known, the, the easiest rheological parameter to understand. Um, so what we do usually when we do, we buy in certain raw materials. The first thing we of course do is a QC test and in many cases this is simply a viscosity test. So we buy in an oil for our uh, for our cooking process, we buy in fruit juice, we buy in a syrup, sugar solution, whatever. The easiest thing we can always do is a rotational test, gives us a viscosity. We have a number and if we have done our homeworks well in our QC, then we know already by that one number whether this is a good material to start with or not. So we can work, for example, with rather simple and robust viscometers like the ones which are shown here at the top right side. There you can see our Hake Visco Tester IQ in different configurations. So it can be used with cone plate, plate plate, cylindrical systems or vein rotors. That's the rugged approach. If you need something with either more sensitivity or higher speed, so if you need something much more versatile, then we have to look into a rheometer. A rheometer which gives you higher sensitivity, higher force, higher speed. And then you can also go to the, to the limits of what's possibly uh, done in rheology. The easiest case, if you look into the viscous behavior of a material, is the so-called Newtonian behavior. What we do is here, you see, we play with the shear rate from smaller to higher shear rates. And independently of the shear rate, the viscosity is always the same. It's a constant value, and this is what we call Newtonian flow behavior. Easy, easy to understand, easy to measure, but unfortunately this happens uh, not so many times. It only happens when you have something like water, like a vegetable oil, like a fruit juice, sugar solution. So when you have something where low molecular weight molecules are in solution or where the fluid itself consists only of low molecular weight uh, molecules. In most cases, when we work with a food, we have to expect um, a behavior which is roughly like this. So we have a non-Newtonian flow behavior. It's not a constant viscosity over a shear rate. So in this case, you see from low shear rates to high shear rates, the viscosity drops. This is what we call shear thinning or pseudoplastic behavior. And this can be very important because now we have, depending on the shear rate or depending on the flow speed, in other words, we have a different behavior. And you see here, for example, milk chocolate, molten milk chocolate, has a viscosity of around 100 pascal second at low shear rates. And the same thing is only around 2 pascal seconds at higher shear rates. So this is a factor of 50. 
And so you can already expect, let's say you want to run your production process a little bit faster and who doesn't want that? You already have to keep in mind, if I run the whole thing faster, I will shear my product uh, and with higher shear rates. And so it's, it's likely that I have to expect lower viscosities, different flow behavior, different dosing behavior. Very important for the production itself or if this would be, for example, not a chocolate to consume, but a chocolate to, to top it on, on a cake, then you also have to keep in mind here the higher viscosities flows down the cake slower, gives a thicker layer, lower viscosity here for the dark chocolate gives a thinner layer or flows down a little bit faster. So depending on what you want to do with it, that's quite different. As a summary, from the production side, all these steps here, mixing, pumping, dosing, filling, all these steps are strongly influenced by the viscosity. And if that varies with the speed of the process, then you really need to have the viscosity curve. In that case here, single point measurements are no longer okay. Here you really have to have the full viscosity curve over the shear rate range, which is relevant for your process. But then in the end also the application, like what I said, covering a cake, dipping a fruit into the chocolate, the mouth feeling afterwards, if you, if you consume that, all that is also interesting to see whether this is a good product or not. So at these, in this case here, viscosity tests are terribly important to get a good product produced and to make it successful on the market. Apart from the simple case of Newtonian and non-Newtonian flow behavior, some materials, not all, only some materials, show also a so-called time dependence of their viscous behavior. In most cases, this is automatically linked with the term thixotropy, which is true, but not the full picture, because you can see it here on the title. Here we talk about thixotropic and rheopactic flow behavior. Thixotropy means we shear a material. So this is something we can do in the rheometer. First, we want to have a reference value, no shear, so oscillation or very low shear rate. And then we know a, a reference value of viscosity. And then we select one constant shear rate over time. And in case the material is thixotropic, then we'll see the viscosity goes down over time until in the end of a successfully designed experiment, we reach a constant value. The idea, the model behind this is that we have a structure inside uh, our material, our sample, our food in this case. And that structure breaks up the longer you shear it at a constant shear rate. Afterwards, we want to see, does it recover again? Because only when this is a reversible process, we can really talk about a pure time dependence. Otherwise, it would simply be we destroy a structure. It's gone. Nothing is going to come back. This is not thixotropy. Here we talk about thixotropic flow behavior. In case it would be the other way around. So we have a starting value and then the viscosity would increase. And when we let the sample relax, it would decrease again. Then we would talk about the rheopactic flow behavior. So the increase of viscosity over time, buildup of structure over time, which happens compared to the thixotropic behavior only rarely. And so if you see that, please check twice before you believe that result. With a test like this here, we can get some absolute data. We have selected one shear rate, which should correlate with our question, with the critical point in production we want to have a look at, with the application. So this one shear rate has to be chosen somehow related to reality. And then, for example, we can get data like this. This is a ketchup, tomato ketchup. And you can see here in the beginning, we collected constant viscosity as a reference value. In this case, something above 100 Pascal seconds. And then from this point on, we started shearing and the viscosity drops by a factor of more than 100. And then after about, what is it here, two minutes of shearing, we stop again and you can see that there is a rather quick recovery and after about one minute, we have full recovery. So we have reached the value we had originally. 
nice picture, but what can I do with that? Here I have absolute data, so I can calculate, for example, the so-called thixotropy index, which is nothing else but the ratio between the viscosity in equilibrium at the beginning and the viscosity at the end of the shearing stage. And in this case, the thixotropy index, Ti, is approximately 180. So then in the end, I can say if I use a shear rate of so and so many reciprocal seconds, in the end, I will get an equilibrium value of about, uh, which is about a factor of 180 less compared to, um, to the original value. And of course, then afterwards, you get an idea about the recovery. So here we see a very fast recovery, approximately one minute after you stop shearing, it's back again. So this kind of information, this kind of test gives you absolute data. You have to select one shear rate linked to the application. And then you get an idea about structural breakdown and how quick the material recovers. If you link this back to our catch-up, this means how strong do I have to shake the whole thing to get it out of the bottle? And how much time do I have after I put it back on the table before I have to redo the shaking part again? So this is something which is probably not critical from the technical point of view, but here we talk about customer expectation. So this is a test for absolute data. There is a second test which is usually more popular to look into time-dependent behavior, and that's the so-called thixotropic loop. What we do here, we just increase the shear rate from zero to a, a final value, on a linear scale, just a constant increase over time, and we follow the stress. In this case, you see here, we ramp up the shear rate, the stress does something like this, then we keep the top shear rate constant for a certain time, and then we see some remaining structural breakdown, viscosity will drop a little bit, and then we reverse the process and we take the same ramp backwards, so from the top shear rate in the same time back to zero, and the interesting bit is the upwards ramp and the downwards ramp, they don't, uh, they don't overlap. They are not identical. And this is exactly what we want to see here. The bigger the difference between these two stress curves, these, between these two flow curves here, the higher the time dependency of the rheological behavior. In other words, I want to evaluate, and this is what's also done in our Hake Rio Wind software, I want to evaluate the area between these two curves. And the bigger that is, the higher the time dependency, in this case it drops the viscosity or the stress, so the higher the thixotropic behavior is. Pay attention, the same thing is also possible, of course, using the viscosity. But if you, oops, I was too quick, I'm sorry. But if you see these white curves over here, you see that the area between these curves is smaller. And this is, the, this is usually the case. So just simply um, to minimize the error, we usually select the flow curves, so the stress as a function of shear rate to evaluate their test. So this is the real data. In this case, we selected two different kinds of ketchup again. And in this case, you see here, we have one sample, one ketchup, which gives us about 611 Pascal per second as the area in between the curves. The other one gives us only 217 Pascal seconds in between. So between the, the viscosity at rest and the viscosity at and after shear, here the difference will be bigger, here the difference will be smaller. Why does a ketchup have to have these properties? First of all, um, it's easier to dose, and if you shake it, then it can easily be poured out of the bottle. Afterwards, when the structure recovers, it's not a low viscous liquid anymore, but it has the capability to sit like a nicely looking lump of ketchup on top of the fries or on top of a piece of meat, wherever you would like to have it for your meal. In the customer's perception also, a stronger structure, a higher viscosity at rest, suggests a higher tomato content and is somewhere in the back of the head related with the quality of the product. So here it's not only the feel of the product, the mouth feeling, it's also the look of the product, 
which which projects the the image of having a high quality product pay attention this is a relative test so only if the uh, flow profile so ramping up in that time maximum shear rate is that value ramping back down again same time if that profile is identical only then you can compare the result it's just a number it's just a fingerprint easily done for Q&C but please keep the parameters of the test constants otherwise you have no way to compare the result of such a test since we are talking about catch up and structure and look and feel the yield stress is the logical choice for the next topic so the yield stress is something which is also interesting for stability for look and feel what we have here we have materials and like with the time dependent behavior only some materials show that behavior not all of them we have here some materials which show a solid like behavior at rest so it behaves like a solid material unless we reach a certain stress a certain force then something breaks down internally and beyond that point we have a liquid like behavior so something breaks down internally is already the keyword at low forces at low stresses we consider to have a network inside that material which stabilizes that which makes the catch shovel look also like a lump like a solid lump of uh, of 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 ketchup on top of your piece of meat the same for mayonnaise the same for mustard if we apply some force then we will see a distortion of this network if we stop at that point the material will not start to flow if we stop here then it will simply be a fully reversible process and from that structure it will go back to the original structure if we push it further literally then this structure will break down and this is now a material which is able to flow also this is a reversible process but it takes a little bit more time so there is a certain limit in stress which distinguishes between it behaves like a solid or it behaves like a liquid and that's pretty interesting to look at here for example i mentioned already ketchup is the example again now we see here an increasing stress and an increase in deformation so the stronger i push the more it changes shape and you see here in the beginning it changes shape on a double log double logarithmic scale with a slope of about 1 1.2 then here we have a sharp bend in the curve and we have a much higher slope of course here at that bend there we can detect the yield stress and you see here we have one product with about almost 30 pascal as a yield stress one which is above 84 pascal and from the practical side this ketchup simply flew out of the bottle when you turn it over that one didn't there you really had to shake it so now please don't mistake me i'm not telling you twice the same stuff but call it fixotropy once and yields just twice when we talk about the fixotropic behavior there we talk about the influence of speed over time so it's just i stir something how far does it break down the yield stress on the other hand um, is simply how much force do you need to do that here for example the question is what is listed on this page would a material would the ketchup flow under its own weight when you turn over the bottle or do you have to squeeze it to get it out of the bottle do you have to shake it before yield stress is about the force the stress fixotropy is about the speed and the time and this is pretty important for many applications you can see here this is uh, from an older presentation we copied that data you can see here depending on what you are looking at um, the yield stress is different you can see here this is rather lower than the examples on the page before so um, from that we expect in that direction that it needs more and more force to make it flow and that it looks more and more solid when at rest ketchup spaghetti sauce rather low but here tomato paste mayonnaise already rather high and this is from the technical point of view for the long time stability of the product since in the tomato paste there are particles there is liquid inside 
but from the let's say marketing point of view the cosmetic point of view it's about the nice look so whether this is ketchup mayonnaise chocolate whatever you want to look at nice whipped cream sits on the cake doesn't flow down this is the reason why you would like to have a yield stress in certain products the same is also true now you see already values on a much higher scale but beware depending on the test method you're using you're also bound to get different values you can see here that also for everything you want to spread on a slice of bread this is an important information if the yield stress is too low the material is too soft then it might uh, might not look nice it must simply flow into the piece of bread if the yield stress is too high then probably it's difficult to get out of the pot to get out of the jar and you might even destroy your slice of bread when you try to spread it again here in this case this is data from literature again the yield stress is the important parameter for um, let's say more the feel than the look so here is it easy to get the peanut butter out of the jar is it convenient to get the chocolate spread over the slice of bread this is the question we ask here how to determine that I showed you the data with the ketchup the green and the blue data some slides ago and that has been really done in the plate plate geometry nicely equilibrated but there are also other ways to do that here for example in our uh, mass you see a very applied way of doing that because um, there is a distinction between the so-called static yield stress and the dynamic yield stress the static st yield stress is the product as it is before you have touched it so in this case the peanut butter sitting inside the glass without taking something out for the classical way plate plate geometry in the rheometer I have to take a little bit out put it between the plates have to squeeze it which also is a pre shear and um, according to this definition there I use uh, I lose already the weak structure inside the sample so if you want to have an idea about the whole properties we are not allowed to destroy that structure the workaround is for example you test it the yield stress directly in the original container the dynamic yield stress is then something where you lost the weak structure already due to the sample preparation the nice part here is we have to, for that reason designed such a special holder which you can adjust in height and here uh, with the black part you can adjust to the diameter so you can get almost every kind of glass for jam for peanut butter chocolate spread butter whatever mustard you can get it in there and then you can do the test directly in the original container if you take that holder off you can even put a 10 liter bucket in our mass it still will fit in we did that for yogurt already the whole test then looks like this you take a vein rotor for the static yield test and you just cut into the top and the top surface of the sample you see here after the test where we took out the vein rotor again it leaves such a star shaped pattern so we destroy the structure while penetrating in the perpendicular axis but we leave the structure in the horizontal plane untouched so we cut in from the top and then we slowly start rotating with a constant speed and then we do an evaluation with the curves like this so this is what you get the green set of curves is from a peanut butter sample done twice in the same sample and the blue set of data here is from a chocolate spread also run twice in the same jar of, of chocolate the result simply is the maximum of that curve so here the peanut butter is around 1800 pascal for the chocolate spread we are around 144 pascal the tricky bit of this you want to have constant test conditions when you want to run that test so what you need is an instrument which gives you very very quickly a constant rotational speed this is the reason why here which we usually don't do plotted the, sh the time axis on a logarithmic scale and you can see here that here it's one second this is less than half a second for the more difficult peanut butter and this is 0.1 second for the let's say softer easier chocolate spread so we have a rather rather quick equilibration of our speed and then we can really say at the time 
when we evaluate that at that time speed is constant and here with the chocolate spread that's constant anyway. So this is really something we needed to do with the rheometer and not with the viscometer. This is a little bit more demanding, although it's a pretty simple test. But you can also do it for some samples with the viscometers. That's, that's no problem. In some areas, some industries, there are standardized tests. So if you're not sure what kind of test method you should use to determine the yield stress, first of all, look into the industry standards. Sometimes it says there, and usually we measure according to in this case here, we're talking about chocolate. In the past, this was called the IOCCC method number 76. Now it's the ICA method 76. So it's the International Chocolate Association, as far as I remember correctly. And that method says, first of all, you have to melt your chocolate according to a certain procedure. Then you do a five minute pre-shear at five reciprocal seconds. And then afterwards, you do basically the thixotropic loop we spoke about some slides ago. So you take a constant increase of shear rate, keep it for a certain time, and then you go down again. This is a standardized profile. If you use that, you can always compare the data. And then in this case, you're not mainly interested in the thixotropic behavior. But what you can also do is here, you can take the viscosity data, or in this case, the stress data, the blue curves here, from the upwards ramp with the original structure, you do an extrapolation. You can see here this faint green line. It's a quadratic fit going back to zero speed and there where it touches the uh, y-axis. This is then my yield stress. So this is basically the stress at zero shear. For the milk chocolate here, we get almost nine Pascal. For the dark chocolate, we get around two Pascal. So again, you see the milk chocolate has the stronger structure inside. The dark chocolate has the weaker structure inside when it, start, when it comes to starting the flow. The amplitude sweep, sorry, a little bit too fast. The amplitude sweep would be the next thing on my list, what I would recommend doing for food rheology. The amplitude sweep is an oscillation test and it has a constant oscillation frequency and usually most of the time you take one hertz in some cases you also take simply 10 radians per second but one hertz is mostly used and you see the frequency stays constant so the distance between maximum and minimum is always constant but step by step by step the amplitude the amount of motion of movement is increased so, of course, you want to start at low deformations. If you would start here, everything you could see there is already destroyed by the bigger deformations. What's that good for? So, one of the easiest tests you can do is you just put something into the rheometer, you increase the amplitude, and you wait till the material breaks. In this case, this is then called the gel strength of a gel. We see here two parameters have been plotted. In this case, this is G1, the so-called storage modulus, which represents the elastic properties of the material, and G2, which is the so-called loss modulus, which represents the viscous part of the properties. So the elastic properties, the, the filled round red circles, and you see they have a certain constant value up to that point, and then structure breaks down, elasticity goes down. So here we have destroyed the gel. This is again a relative test because depending on the oscillation frequency, the length of that plateau is different. But very useful, commonly used, also used to get an idea about how strong different uh, gels are on a small scale when you synthesize them directly in, in the rheometer. Here is a practical example. Here we just plotted G1, so the storage modulus. And what we have here are different chocolate drinks, cacao milk, whatever. In the past, when I was a child, the typical approach was you buy a bottle of that, you shake it, you drink it. Because we all know the cacao particles, they usually sediment and we form this brown ring at the bottom of the milk, of the, of the chocolate milk. Nowadays, the manufacturers of these products, they want, to, they want to help us a little bit and they want to avoid that. So they put thickeners into the chocolate milk, which 
reduce or which stop the sedimentation of the cacao particles. And you can see here in this case, um, depending on what kind and of additive, whether it's xanthan gum, whether it's gua, whatever, and of course also how much you put inside, here you see almost no stabilization, blue is already higher, green even higher, and the black curve shows the highest value of yield stress. And we could see with the samples we had in our lab here in Germany that also the tendency um, of sedimentation was reduced with increasing yield stress. In other words, if you want to make a material stable over time, I guess sedimentation, phase separation against uh, losing air bubbles, which look so nice inside, then you should consider introducing a yield stress by, for example, a carefully selected thickener. You have a strawberry jam and the strawberries always drop to the ground. Here we have to introduce a yield stress to keep the strawberries afloat, for example. The next thing in oscillation would be the frequency sweep. So the frequency sweep now keeps the amplitude constant, an amplitude we have determined by the amplitude sweep before used as a pretest. And now we play with the speed. You can see here at the top we have low frequency, medium, high frequency. And now in the end it really doesn't matter whether you start with the low or with the high frequencies because the strength, the amount of movement, the amplitude is always the same. So the damage we do is always the same. We only do it faster or slower. So here it's up to you whether you would like to start at high or at low frequencies. It can be used, for example, for gel-like food. In this case, um, frequency sweep of vitamin gels. Some of those are used as a nutritional additive. So a functional food, for example, something to give your children. Or it can also be used if you, for example, are um, somebody who loves to run the marathon. If you run over such a long distance, then you would like to help your body adding some calories, adding some minerals that you lost during sweating. And in that case, you don't want to stop for having a snack or you want to waste energy and if you put too much load to your stomach. So the special food, uh, special shops for, for sports and equipment, they have offered a kind of a special gel. You put that into your mouth and this is just a concentrated gel containing the minerals, the calories, a nice taste, a nice flavor, and that's it so that you can just have a small package in your mouth, you chew the gel and your body should feel refreshed afterwards. Very important, very convenient. So in that case, it's more about how to stabilize all that. In other cases, it's also about the swallowing resistance and I'll come back to that at the end of the presentation because also the swallowing resistance is strongly influenced by the gel structure. So if the gel structure is too strong, the whole thing can be unpleasant. If it's too weak, it can be the same. So we need to find an optimum here. Something which is also important, we are talking about frequency. So we are talking about speed, high frequency, fast process. So if you want to have a look into what does it do if I change the speed in my process, spraying, filling, extrusion, then you could also do a frequency sweep and you already get an idea how will the properties of your material change if you increase or decrease the process speed. Temperature dependence. We all know rheological properties, especially the viscosity, they depend on temperature. We all know we heat something up, the viscosity drops. So you can see here in oscillation, we do it that way that we keep constant amplitude, constant frequency and we just increase or decrease the temperature. And then we can follow processes like this, for example, where we start at minus 20 degrees and heat an ice cream up to see when does it start to soften, when does the curve go down and from what point on is it fully molten. So is it nice and creamy and convenient to scoop it out of the box you bought it with does it melt nicely at the right temperature in your mouth? And afterwards, do you have a creamy sensation in your mouth on your tongue? Is it pleasant? How is the mouth feeling? That's easily done with a test like this. Even more boring, 
time dependence. Now you can see nothing. Nothing is changing at all. You see frequency stays constant, amplitude stays constant, and even the temperature doesn't do anything. So from the instrument side, we keep everything constant. Whatever happens now has to come from the sample itself. And in this case, you see we take either milk or we take soya milk, depending on whether we talk about, let's say, for example, making cheese or tofu, like in Asia. And then you can see we add an enzyme, and this is then the catalyst. This is the starting point for the reaction. And you can see here at the beginning, G1, the elastic properties are lower than G2, the viscous properties. So this means it's a mainly viscous liquid, liquid-like character. The further the time runs, the, the smaller the distance between these two becomes. And now here we even have a crossover. And afterwards we have more elasticity, less viscous behavior. So from that point on, we can talk about we have formed a gel, increasing degree of cross-linking, and somewhere in the end it should level off into a plateau. And this is what we can do with such a test. We can determine it started as a liquid, it ended as an elastic gel, and for, very, uh, for many processes, very important, how much time do we need to make it uh, gel from the liquid stage? So in this case, this would be something like six to seven minutes after starting the process, and then you have something which is already mainly gel-like. Yet then you can do the optimization of your process on a gram scale, playing with the temperature, with the kind of enzyme, with the amount of enzyme, whatever, and you get a good idea about how it affects, in this case, your cheese making process. Since this is a process where the properties change tremendously, so we start with G1, for example, at around 0 0.01, and we add somewhere at almost 10. So this is then one, two, three orders of magnitude, almost, not completely. We want to use the so-called controlled deformation mode on the rheometer and oscillation, the CD mode, because here the amplitude is kept constant and the instrument feeds the necessary stress, the necessary torque into the system to maintain that. So we keep the amplitude constant and we basically measure the, the stress. Texture analysis. This is something we can also do. It's not typical rheology. Since a modern rheometer has a very good lift and a good normal force detector, what we can do is we can, for example, take a piece of chocolate. We put it onto two blades. This is basically like a three-point bending system. We take a piston and the rheometer just drives down the lift with a constant speed. And from the contact position, it starts to bend the chocolate in the end it breaks it. And we see here, in this case, we compared a dark and a milk chocolate of the same manufacturer. And as we would expect it, the dark chocolate needs more force to break, and it's a very sharp snap, and it's broken. And the milk chocolate needs less force, and it's really a soft, a continuous breaking process. And this is, in the end, what we expect. So this is the reason why the product here is a successful one. We expect dark chocolate to splinter, to be harder. We expect milk chocolate to be more creamy, more soft. And this is not only that we want to feel that, this is also related to the sound chocolate makes when it breaks. This is really something the chocolate makers, this, they, they adjust, they optimize that. So in this case, the breaking of chocolate can be done the same can also be done here with the margarine, because there it's again about spreadability. One test we learned is just contact with the surface of the margarine in the original pot, linear motion into the margarine penetration up to this point, keep that position and simply wait how the resisting force develops. The whole thing looks like this. If you look at the data, so you see during the penetration, the normal force builds up and then you see a decay over time. And from that profile, you can read something about the spreadability of the material. How easy is the force distributed inside the matrix? You can see that this test has been done eight times, simply for the reason that depending on the position inside such a cup or such a box with margarine inside, whether it's closer to the center, closer to the outer rim, 
um, the the strong strength of the structure varies. So this is not a product which is, has the same properties all over its own container. Rheology under pressure is something I just want to shortly mention because nowadays many industrial cooking processes are done in uh, under higher pressure to shorten the cooking time, to preserve the vitamins and of course to save energy and money during the production process. We have equipment for that, basically like little pressurized vessels um, going up to pressures of several, 100, several hundred bars. And we can use cylindrical rotors or vein rotors if you want to look into food which has larger pieces, fruit pieces or whatever inside. And then we could also do tests on those. Rheology and microscopy. Why would I want to do something like that? First of all, it's interesting to see why things happen inside the rheometer. The rheometer only tells us how the material changes, but sometimes you also would like to know why this is the case. So what we did is we introduced a microscope into this rather bulky accessory because it contains not only the microscope, but also the temperature control. And if you look carefully, you see this gray little slit here. This is where the lens of the microscope is sitting underneath. Um, why we want to do that. Here, as an example, we, you see the cooking of a starch, native potato starch in its original state at room temperature. You see the sharply outlined crystals. Here we used crossed polar, polar, polarizing filters, sorry. And so then we increase the temperature. You can see here temperature profile goes up to 90 degrees, keeps constant, goes down to 25 or 20 degrees and then keeps like that. Viscosity sharply increases, then drops again and levels off at this value. The quality of the cooking process in the end um, is rated whether you were really able to get a homogeneous starch solution in the end. And in this case, you see in the beginning at room temperature, a little bit above, sharply defined crystals. At higher temperature, swollen crystals still clearly visible. But unfortunately, also you can see here is still the outline of a definitely swollen, much bigger crystalline domain, but it's still not a homogeneous solution. So here we have the clear indication. Okay, we get a change in properties, we get the increase in viscosity, but the product has not been really cooked perfectly. Not possible to see this without an additional method like the microscopy in this case. The rheometer only tells us how far does the viscosity change. Same thing is also true for the crystallinity, the crystallization of fat, in this case for chocolate. So here we had two different kinds of fats. You can see from plus 50 to zero degrees. In this case, here we see crossover at this point. Here it's the crystalline product, a one-step process. And here the rheometer tells us it's a one, two-step process. Okay, so far we see this in the rheometer. What we didn't see with the rheometer this kind of fat here makes circular round shaped crystalline domains. This one here makes sharp needle like domains, which also is a significant difference in the mouth feeling afterwards. Again, we have the mechanical properties. When does it crystallize? How hard, how solid does it become? And now we also have some microscopic information about how's the structure, where are the differences in the microstructure. If you have a look into foam-like materials, you could also do that here. I cheated a little bit because I couldn't find an example from the food area. I used shaving foam in this case. And you see here we did a test at low shear at the beginning, then a high shear test. And you see the bubbles homogenize. So you get um, a wide distribution of size in the beginning, a very narrow distribution of size at the end. Also, the average size, of course, changes, and you see why the stability is different after you sheared the material. So in this case, bubble size went down, stability went up, and this is something we did with an additional software, the so-called SPIP software from the Danish company Image Metrology, which we use for the automatic evaluation of our rheological results. And in the end, we come to elongational viscosity, probably the most exotic uh, topic, because usually we link um, viscosity with a rotational process. 
But if we take, for example, here our Hake Kaber 1, the only commercially available elongation areometer for fluids, then we can put a liquid, so a little drop, between these two gray plates we can see here in the drawing on the left side. In the original state, they are very close to each other, something like two or three millimeters apart from each other. And then the upper plate quickly jumps upwards and stretches the liquid to such a filament with this typical shape here, being narrower in the center and wider at the end. And then we have somewhere here in our instrument a laser micrometer, which detects the thickness, the width of this filament at its center, and does that over time to see how that filament collapses in the end. Very small sample, very quick test, and the longer the lifetime, the higher the elongational viscosity, the higher the elastic properties. And since this is a totally different way of putting stress on the sample, this is something we cannot do with any classical rotational or oscillation rheometer. Why do we want to do that? You can already see this here. The chocolate sauce pours from the can onto the little muffin or whatever it is. And you can see this is exactly the flow profile. Here it's wide, it becomes more narrow, and here it becomes wide again. So here where it flows, the sample is stretched under the weight of all the liquid which is beyond whatever point I look at. And so we have an elongational flow and the question whether it's nicely poured or whether it starts to dribble and to rip, this is very important for the nice look. And so we can have here the look and feel. Swallowing behavior is a very important topic because there also we squeeze something through our mouth into our stomach. The mouth feeling itself, if we use our tongue to squeeze something upwards, then we have um, also an elongational process, but also for the industrial part of the food. Do I, do I fill something? Because this here in the end could also be regarded as a filling process. Put some liquid into a container. Spraying. You come with a wide line, you go through a very narrow nozzle, strong elongational characteristics of the flow, and the same is also true for 3D food printing, for example. There you squeeze something through the printing nozzle. Practical applications. Since we are talking about mouth feeling, here we had two yogurts. The one, the red curve, was of the standard full fat product, the blue curve of the low fat product. That's what we all want. We would like to be able to eat tasty stuff, but we won't want, don't want to get fat. So the industry tries to help that, offers us products with a reduced fat content, but then unfortunately also the texture, the mouth feeling uh, is, is affected. And since we don't accept that it also now looks different, tastes different, and might even feel different, we have to adjust that. So in this case, it's a starch-based fat substitute. And you see in this case, a little bit of work still has to be done because the breakup time here is that where the curve sharply goes downward is longer for the full fat product compared to the reduced calorie product, which means this one feels more creamy and this one goes more towards watery, thinner structure. Very quick test on a gram scale with a caber, and then you can optimize the product in the lab before you really do uh, the test with a, with, a, with a panel or on a larger scale. With salad dressings, there we had an example. It would have been funny if the, the customer wasn't so angry about that uh, because he wanted to design one of the salad dressings we see in the supermarkets where you see herbal particles are kept in suspension due to the adding some thickeners, like santan gum, for example. In that case, the formulation was not optimal because what happened, some of these formulations, they had a rather long breakup time, as you can see here on the right side. And unfortunately, this led to a slimy impression. Just imagine you pour something on your salad, you stop pouring and then it takes some seconds and you see an elastic liquid basically oozing up and downwards before it snaps. The customers didn't like that in the end. And so um, although all the ingredients were great, the taste was good, it simply didn't look nice. And so this is why we dubbed the, the term psychoreology for that, because here it was just about the, the visual perception. With the caber, we could test different formulations of thickeners and very quickly reduce 
this unpleasant effect. You can see here from the right to the left, the breakup time was reduced. And then we had something which looked rich, but snapped immediately. And so just poured on the salad and looked very nice. So that was really a big success. And the last example I would like to show you, we spoke already um, in the context of the frequency sweep about um, swallowing um, behavior. There is still a current topic about uh, the swallowing behavior or swallowing disorders, which is even part of a European research project and many companies are working on that because elderly people sooner or later are affected by that. I think it is 40% of people above 70, they suffer from swallowing disorders. And so they cannot enjoy the, their food anymore. In other cases, due to an injury, an accident, or sometimes also there are some side effects of certain medications, you can have swallowing disorders. So basically the muscles which do the swallowings, they don't work as they should. What you could do, you could increase the elasticity of your food. And this can be done by certain additives. So research has shown high elongational, high extensional properties. It helps because it keeps the lump of food, the so-called bolus, together. It doesn't disappear to the left and to the right. And then you can really swallow it in one go and it doesn't feel unpleasant. So what do they do? To prepare this kind of special food, normal food, like even piece of meat is being cooked. Then you prepare a puree, you add certain additives, and then you shape the food to resemble the original. So if you look carefully, this sausage here has a flat bottom because it comes from a mold. So this is not a real sausage. It has been prepared to that procedure here. And also here, the, the cabbage and the pieces of meat. This is already meat which has been ground to fine pieces. Additives have been added and then it has been formed to look like a piece of pork so that it really you can enjoy eating your food and don't feel like an astronaut having everything in a puree shape. Also for drinks, additives are being used if the viscosity is too low so that it's easier to swallow. This is something I know especially from elder people. In general, I hope I can could prove to you that with a rheometer you can have a look into many properties which are interesting. First of all, for the production process, but then afterwards also to design the product to make it a successful product because to look at food, to eat food and to enjoy food also means to get the expected or the wanted rheological properties. Only as a consumer we would call it differently. We would speak about is it creamy enough, does it have the right bite, is the texture good. So with all these different methods I showed you, I think we have very powerful tools in hand to control the production process and in the end to make very successful products. Thank you so far for your attention. And I would like to hand back to Fritz to open the question. Thank you very session. much, Klaus, for this really interesting and comprehensive presentation. I would like to open now the Q&A session. Um, Please feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. Uh, maybe we start with the first question here. You have mentioned different tests for yield stress determination for chocolate and the CS ramp. Regarding quality control, which one is faster, which one is more accurate? Ah, difficult question because um, the fastest test usually with the yield stress is probably uh, it depends on is is probably a test like I've shown it with the chocolate test where you simply run a ramp, you standardize that ramp, you do the extrapolation. Um, which is the more accurate is a little bit tricky because. Um, I would always prefer the CS ramp because in that case you have your yield stress within the data you collected. So you have data below the yield stress where the product still behaves like a solid and you have data above. And this is always much more safer compared to doing an extrapolation where you just use a mathematical model to go uh, outside your data that you really measured. The CS ramp on the other side takes a little bit more experience 
and also needs maybe a pretest or two, and then you can run that. But in the end, if it's possible, I would always prefer to run the CS ramp. The data in the end, from my point of view, is much more reliable, and it can also be used to determine rather low shear rates. It's also a very sensitive method. But in the end, it depends on what kind of equipment you have in hand, because for that you need an instrument which has a CS capability and a certain sensitivity, so a real rheometer. And of course, also you can measure as, as perfect and as precise as you want, but if you don't comply with the industry standard, then you might uh, have valuable data in hand, but you cannot compare it. So I cannot really give you but the Thank you very much for that. discussing it, Klaus. Um, there are no further questions in the Q&A box. So um, I would like to uh, finish the webinar today. As mentioned at the start of the webinar, you will be receiving links to the webinar presentation and the recorded uh, the recording itself once these have been prepared for publication. We would like to thank you very much for attending today and we are looking forward to welcoming you soon to an upcoming material characterization webinar. Thank you and goodbye.